strange or odd if civil society is independent of governments. It seems that governments and civil society are definitely talking about accessibility issues in a fairly equal proportion. About 60% of government's uh, communications are on accessibility issues, and it was about the same uh, for, for civil society groups. 10% uh, of their communications were on nutrition, and, uh, and about 31% on, on availability challenges. Well, let's, let's just get into some of the, the material from, from government documents. And these are from documents produced by ministries, by uh, uh, offices of the presidency, of the prime minister, uh, by particular regulators. So on availability, um, a lot of the attention was on, uh, well, sustainability was actually the most commonly, uh, commonly used term uh, when, when governments are talking about food. In Gabon, for instance, uh, they, they rushed to point out in, the, in their public relations material that uh, Gabonese palm oil is going to be 100% certified by the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil. So they're very clearly trying to, to make a link between uh, the operations of Olam and Siet Gabon, the two big palm oil producers, to uh, this governance initiative globally on, on, on making palm oil more sustainable. Um, in Cameroon, uh, ministers uh, are also pushing the idea that uh, you know you've got to you've got to do something about large scale hunting. So let's uh, let's domesticate wild animals and get rid of the bushmeat trade. So there's a lot of attention to increasing availability through domesticating uh, cane rats, dweekers, which are small antelopes, and other uh, tr foods that have been traditionally hunted, and and, and turning those into uh, into kind of small scale uh, operations. Which is interesting, because it's not just that governments are supporting the large-scale palm oil producers, they're also supporting this kind of development of, of, of a smaller-scale uh, agriculture. Now, interestingly, though, um, there is a drive in this literature um, here uh, on availability uh, for greater food self-sufficiency. Every single government in CMAQ wants to be more food self-sufficient. Uh, many of them are supporting a drive at the World Trade Organization right now to enable uh, in, in, enable that agenda, and we could talk about it later if you want. But essentially, the Gabonese uh, convey this uh, the best. They want food self sufficiency, but in a particular kind of way. They want a big push for new investments to develop intensive agriculture and agro industry for food and cash crops. So, alongside subsistence and that idea of, of you know, maybe uh, domesticating wild animals, uh, in Gabon, you've got a big push for intensive agriculture and agro industry coming out of the government literature. Now, on accessibility, um, governments have been absolutely concerned with prices and inequality issues. There were subsidies introduced after the food price crisis, 07 and 08, to try to uh, rein in some of the issues that, that might be discussed in the next talk in the series on, on food riots. And uh, on inequality, um, and, and addressing inequality, there's, there's been an you know, attempt in the, in the government literature to rationalize the subsidy regimes or to talk about reforming the subsidy regimes and what that might look like. There's also, uh, I, I think, uh, in, in some ways, though, and this is, this is interesting uh, from my perspective, you've got, you've got particular governments that continue to denigrate agriculture and, and seek to rely on, on, foreign, on foreign foods or foods that are of foreign origin. So Equatorial Guinea, for example, is kind of uh, indicative here. They have this, uh, this perspective in, in, the, uh, in, their, in their advertisements uh, that have appeared in Jeanne Afrique. Uh, from the Gulf of Guinea is a stream of crudes flowing that is so significant that in just a few short years it has transformed Equatorial Guinea from an agricultural backwater into one of sub-Saharan Africa's largest oil exporters with the GDP per capita higher than many European countries. Yeah, why wouldn't uh, you want to rely on, on foreign foods if, if you're richer than many European countries, I guess. But there's still some, some palpable kind of de uh, denigration of, uh, of, of agricultural activities in, in the government communications that we reviewed. Um, and you could say that kind of uh, spills into the, the perspectives on adequacy um, that governments articulate. Very few of them. Uh, but when they do, it's often very paternalistic. Uh, in, in the Central African Republic, the previous government, uh, help me out here, Francois Boisizé, uh, who was turfed uh, by these rebels uh, over Christmas and throughout the new year last year, um, Boisizé, uh, in, in one of his government reports, talks about um, the poor use that women are making of the nutrition, education, resources, and training that our government supplies. So it's poor people's <laughs> fault for not taking advantage of, of the, these you know, wonderful things that we've given them. So this is, uh, again, this paternalistic view on, on health coming from governments. Now, here's, uh, I guess, the, the, the final uh, grouping the, of stakeholders were multilateral and bilateral organizations. Now these, uh, largely, uh, we, we have 
uh, I think bilaterals were in a smaller proportion. So it's really <coughs> dominated by, this could be a weakness, which we didn't discuss in the paper that we've submitted, but anyway. Uh, multilateral uh, organizations kind of dominate this, but 49% of the communications are on availability challenges and in roughly equal proportion on, uh, on, on the other two. On, uh, let's just see if I can slide down the page here. here we go. So what were they saying uh, that were different or the same as, as others? Well, I think one thing that comes clearly out of this literature is attention to what to do to the food after it's produced. Um, you know, if governments aren't talking about it and civil society organizations aren't talking, what do you actually do to preserve food? What about refrigeration, cold storage? What about just regular storage to keep things, pests out of there? And so there's a huge attention in that literature to develop the development of post-harvest systems as a means to, to contribute to enhancing availability. Um, there's also, I, I think, uh, some, some interesting uh, divides and uh, uh, in addition to kind of, you know, the, the multilateral organizations and bilaterals recognizing that, you know, in addition to food aid uh, as a means to increase availability, you also have to work on this post-harvest front. Um, there, there is a divide between, between groups uh, like the IMF um, that view uh, agricultural investment as a source of stability. And what, what they mean by this is increasing the component of GDP uh, or the, the footprint of agriculture in the regional economy is going to make it more stable because it's going to delink it a bit from oil. If all these countries have been fundamentally dependent on oil exports and revenues from oil exports that can be highly volatile, a source of stability in the IMF view is to have more agricultural investment and, and a greater attention to agriculture in the region. Whereas the FAO comes at the you know, investment in agriculture as, as, as the breadbasket question. Let's get food produced for the region. So, so if you're in a ministry office, the Ministry of Agriculture, Minadur in, in Yaoundé, you're going to hear the IMF talking about the need for agriculture to make the economy bro more broadly stable, and you're going to hear the FAO talking about how you know, investment in agriculture is going to actually make us more food secure. So this is a, a, a really curious divide. And, and this also happens uh, in the advocacy for, uh, for extension. So the FAO talks about the need for, for small-scale attention, uh, uh, you know, attention to smallholders and, and family farms and extending knowledge to those people, whereas the IMF would argue that uh, extension uh, needs to be about large-scale. It needs to be, yeah. Sorry. Tractors. Tractors, yes. <laughs> yeah. Agreed. Um, now, on accessibility themes, uh, fuel and price have always uh, have been a big concern uh, of, of the IMF in particular. Uh, concerns that the government's attempt to subsidize fuel have been captured by the top 20% of, of, the, of the income distribution and that, and that poor people are not actually getting access to subsidized fuel and the implications of this very expensive fuel subsidy regime that's been introduced. I think in most countries they, they, in the region they, they did subsidize fuel. Um, more uh, multilateral communications, and this is interesting if you're someone who's a, a student of, of the UN system and especially the UNDP, most multilateral organizations are focusing on the economic aspects of accessibility, so prices and costs, rather than the social aspects of, of access to food, like gender. So gender doesn't really factor in so much in, in this literature. And when it does, it's, it's used in very, very loose ways in support of maybe the Millennium Development Goals and, and less about specific uh, in interventions that would empower women to have better food access. Um, now, on, on adequacy, and, and this is, I guess, uh, another big point that, that, I, that I would make, is that basically everything is about malnutrition. Nothing coming out of the multilateral and bilateral community on dietary diversity in our review at all, traditional diets, cultural appropriateness. Um, so international organizations are talking about women and children, school feeding, addressing nutrient and caloric deficiencies. Uh, and they're expressing concern about average diets. Now the one thing that, that does come out in, in this literature that doesn't come out anywhere else is, is something that we're calling a CMAX nutritional paradox, which is the per persistent undernutrition in the context of overnutrition. So while people are relying more on fats and starches, uh, carbohydrates, sedentary lifestyles come in, and, and you've got this kind of interesting paradox of undernutrition existing in a region where there's this overnutrition is on the rise. And so, uh, I think I can, uh, can safely uh, say that you know, these, these organizations don't necessarily uh, talk about taste, cultural appropriateness uh, that often. So, so what are some conclusions from this very large uh, literature review? Well, I mean, if you just go by the numbers on availability, businesses and multilateral organizations talk about the physical availability of food a lot more than governments and civil society groups do. 
in this literature, accessibility, governments have been obsessed over, over incomes and, and prices, and civil society groups have, have also talked about accessibility quite a bit, uh, more than, than say multilateral organizations and businesses. And adequacy is you know, discussed less, uh, multilaterals and bilaterals discuss it the most, but as I said, it's highly concentrated on, uh, on nutrition. Civil society groups talk about health and, 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 and tradition in kind of equal proportion. And governments and businesses don't necessarily touch that. Now, what, what we argue and what you've heard me heard, heard kind of do in this uh, presentation is, is you know, that these figures don't necessarily capture a bunch of gaps. Just the, you know, if you look at the raw figures, you're going to see, yeah, there are divides. There's divides on perspectives from these you know, various stakeholder groups. But I've, I've, I'll just summarize a few that I've already covered. So there is a big divide between businesses and civil society on sustainability. Um, you know, corporate divides on production. So you've got companies that say food aid is going to solve the availability challenge and others that say we need uh, small scale local organic inputs. Um, while other firms say let's construct a giant fertilizer factory. Um, you've got this divide between the IMF and the FAO um, over, uh, over you know, agriculture as a source of stability or agriculture as a source of sustenance. Um, you've got also um, some interesting divides between business and civil society and turning to accessibility on, uh, on employment, civil society being highly critical of formal sector employment as a contribution to food security. This is something that I was really, even having interviewed people from all, all these stakeholder groups uh, on a related topic, I, I never really got that sense until we did this review of just how critical civil society groups are of the formal sector in, in these resource dependent economies. Um, and civil society and business are actually not always divided, and this is this point I made earlier in the talk, civil society and business are very much aligned on marketing bottlenecks. Both businesses and, 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 and groups that are advocating on behalf of people in a nonprofit way are suggesting that the police, uh, the roads, the ports, it's all bad news for people and it's not just business that's paying, it's people themselves that are paying and this is bad for, for people's access economically to food. And, uh, I guess on the adequacy piece, there is a general inattention to culture except from civil society. There's paternalism, as, as, as I mentioned in that quote. And then there's this, this paradox of, of over and under nutrition. So the implications here uh, from, our, from our study, I've got to wrap this. It's, I can't believe we went an hour. Uh, perspectives matter. Perspectives absolutely matter. I, I said it at the outset with the reference to Jagdish Bhagwani. Um, trying to understand it is very complicated. This is a ridiculously large review of literature. And, and some of these things we probably could have guessed at the outset, but now we actually have some data to, to back up uh, our claims. So, so, um, so the, the big questions moving forward that we, that we ask in the paper in a more detailed way, and then we'll just kind of leave hanging in the room right now, like who has the power? to realize their vision for, for food security. Taking a look at this, this sea of perspectives, who's actually empowered to, to get the vision for availability that they want? Um, when particular stakeholder groups come together and push for one vision on accessibility, do they overwhelm a minority viewpoint? If so, how? Um, so lots of questions arise from this research. Um, what, what we want to do, uh, we kind of recognize that, that basically everything we've reviewed here is, is, is an elite source. Empowered people have written these reports. People who are from abroad have written these reports. People who are in government ministries who are you know, relatively well off. But we haven't really heard much from, from regular people in CIMAC, whether it's Boya in, you know, people in Boya in Cameroon where, where Alexander uh, is from or, or, or elsewhere. We just don't know. So we want to know more. And I think respecting those viewpoints, are, are, that's going to be the order of the day moving forward. So for now, we'll just uh, open it up to questions. I know there's a lot of information coming at you. Um, hopefully some of it was, was useful. And uh, thanks so much for, for hearing us out. Yeah.